section 10 of the chorus girl and other stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc the chorus girl and other stories by anton chekhov translated by constant garnett bad weather big raindrops were pattering on the dark windows it was one of those disgusting summer holiday rains which when they have begun last a long time for weeks till the frozen holiday maker grows used to it and sinks into complete apathy it was cold there was a feeling of raw unpleasant dampness the mother-in-law of a lawyer called kavshkin and his wife nadyezhka filipovna dressed in waterproofs and shawls were sitting over the dinner table in the dining room it was written on the countenance of the elder lady that she was thank god well fed well clothed and in good health that she had married her only daughter to a good man and now could play her game of patience with an easy conscience her daughter a rather short plump fair young woman of twenty with a gentle anemic face was reading a book with her elbows on the table judging from her eyes she was not so much reading as thinking her own thoughts which were not in the book neither of them spoke there was a sound of pattering rain and from the kitchen they could hear the prolonged yawns of the cook kavshkin himself was not at home on rainy days he did not come to the summer villa but stayed in town damp rainy weather affected his bronchitis and prevented him from working he was of the opinion that the sight of the gray sky and the tears of rain on the window deprived one of energy and induced the spleen in the town where there was a greater comfort bad weather was scarcely noticed after two games of patience the old lady shuffled the cards and took a glance at her daughter i have been trying with the cards whether it will be fine to-morrow and whether our alexey stepanovitch will come she said it is five days since he was here the weather is a chastement from god nadiza filipovna looked indifferently at her mother got up and began walking up and down the room the barometer was rising yesterday said she doubtfully but they say it is falling again to-day the old lady laid out the cards in three long rows and shook her head do you miss him she asked glancing at her daughter of course i see you do i should think so he hasn't been here for five days in may the utmost was two or at most three days and now it is serious five days i am not his wife and yet i miss him and yesterday when i heard the barometer was rising i ordered them to kill a chicken and prepare a carp for alexey stepanovitch he likes them your poor father couldn't bear fish but he likes it he always eats it with relish my heart aches for him said the daughter we are dull but it is duller still for him you know mamma i should think so in the law courts day in and day out and the empty flat at night alone like an owl and what is so awful mamma he is alone there without servants there is no one to set this samoir or bring him water why doesn't he engage a valet for the summer months and what use is the summer villa at all if he does not care for it i told him there was no need to have it but no it is for the sake of your health he said and what is wrong with my health it makes me ill that he should have to put up with so much on my account looking over her mother's shoulder the daughter noticed a mistake in the patients 
bent down to the table and began correcting it a silence followed both looked at the cards and imagined how their alexey stepanovitch utterly forlorn was sitting now in the town in his gloomy empty study and working hungry exhausted yearning for his family do you know what mamma said natiza filipnova suddenly and her eyes began to shine if the weather is the same to-morrow i'll go by the first train and see him in town anyway i shall find out how he is have a look at him and pour out his tea and both of them began to wonder how it was that this idea so simple and easy to carry out had not occurred to them before it was only half an hour in the train to the town and then twenty minutes in a cab they said a little more and went off to bed in the same room feeling more contented oh ho ho lord forgive us sinners sighed the old lady when the clock in the hall struck two there is no sleeping you are not asleep mamma the daughter asked in a whisper i keep thinking of alosha i only hope he won't ruin his health in town goodness knows where he dines and lunches in restaurants and taverns i have thought of that myself sighed the old lady the heavenly mother save and preserve him but the rain the rain in the morning the rain was not pattering on the panes but the sky was still gray the trees stood looking mournful and at every gust of wind they scattered drops the footprints on the muddy path the ditches and the ruts were full of water natiza filipnova made up her mind to go give him my love said the old lady wrapping her daughter up tell him not to think too much about his cases and he must rest let him wrap his throat up when he goes out the weather god help us and take him the chicken food from home even if cold is better than at a restaurant the daughter went away saying that she would come back by an evening train or else next morning but she came back long before dinner time when the old lady was sitting on her trunk in her bedroom and drowsily thinking what to cook for her son-in-law's supper going into the room her daughter pale and agitated sank on the bed without uttering a word or taking off her hat and pressed her head into the pillow but what is the matter said the old lady in surprise why back so soon where is alexey stepanovitch natiza filipinova raised her head and gazed at her mother with dry imploring eyes he is deceiving us mamma she said what are you saying christ be with you cried the old lady in alarm and her cap slipped off her head who is going to deceive us lord have mercy on us he is deceiving us mamma repeated her daughter and her chin began to quiver how do you know cried the old lady turning pale our flat is locked up the porter tells me that alosha has not been home once for these five days he is not living at home he is not at home not at home she waved her hands and burst into loud weeping uttering nothing but not at home not at home she began to be hysterical what's the meaning of it muttered the old woman in horror why he wrote the day before yesterday that he never leaves the flat where is he sleeping holy saints natiza filipinova felt so faint that she could not take off her hat she looked about her blankly as though she had been drugged and convulsively clutched at her mother's arms what a person to trust a porter said the old lady fussing round her daughter and crying what a jealous girl you are he is not going to deceive you and how dare he we are not just anybody though we are of the merchant class yet he has no right for you are his lawful wife we can take proceedings 
I gave twenty thousand roubles with you. You did not want for a dowry. And the old lady herself sobbed and gesticulated, and she felt faint, too, and lay down on her trunk. Neither of them noticed that patches of blue had made their appearance in the sky, that the clouds were more transparent, that the first sunbeam was cautiously gliding over the wet grass in the garden, that with renewed gaiety the sparrows were hopping about the puddles which reflected the racing clouds. Towards evening Kashkin arrived. Before leaving town he had gone to his flat and had learned from the porter that his wife had come in his absence. "'Here I am,' he said gaily, coming into his mother-in-law's room and pretending not to notice their stern and tear-stained faces here i am it's five days since we have seen each other he rapidly kissed his wife's hand and his mother-in-law's with the air of a man delighted at having finished a difficult task he lolled in an armchair ow he said puffing out all the air from his lungs here i have been worried to death i have scarcely sat down for almost five days now i have been as it were bivouacking i haven't been to the flat once would you believe it i have been busy the whole time with the meeting of shipnovs and ivanit chalvats creditors i've had to work in galvet's office at the shop i've had nothing to eat or drink and slept on a bench i was chilled through i hadn't a free minute i hadn't even time to go to the flat that's how i came not to be at home nadushka and kashkin holding his sides as though his back were aching glanced stealthily at his wife and mother-in-law to see the effect of his lie or as he called it diplomacy the mother-in-law and wife were looking at each other in joyful astonishment as though beyond all hope and expectation they had found something precious which they had lost their faces beamed their eyes glowed my dear man cried the old lady jumping up why am i sitting here tea tea at once perhaps you are hungry of course he is hungry cried his wife pulling off her head a bandage soaked in vinegar mamma bring the wine and the savouries natalia lay the table oh my goodness nothing is ready and both of them frightened happy and bustling ran about the room the old lady could not look without laughing at her daughter who had slandered an innocent man and the daughter felt ashamed the table was soon laid kashkin who smelt of madeira and liqueurs and could scarcely breathe from repletion complained of being hungry forced himself to munch and kept on talking of the meeting of shipnovs and ivanchikov's creditors while his wife and mother-in-law could not take their eyes off his face and both thought how clever and kind he is how handsome all serene thought kashkin as he lay down on the well-filled feather bed though they are regular tradesmen's wives though they are philistines yet they have a charm of their own and one can spend a day or two of the week here with enjoyment he wrapped himself up got warm and as he dozed off he said to himself all serene End of chapter 15 Recorded by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section number 16 of The Chorus Girl and Other Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Chorus Girl and Other Stories by Anton Chekhov Translated by Constant Garnett A Gentleman Friend 
the charming Vanda, or, as she was described in her passport, the honourable citizen Natasha Canavan, found herself, on leaving the hospital, in a position she had never been in before, without a home to go to or a farthing in her pocket. What was she to do? The first thing she did was to visit a pawnbroker's and pawn her turquoise ring, her one piece of jewellery. They gave her a rouble for the ring. But what can you get for a rouble? You can't buy for that sum a fashionable short jacket, nor a big hat, nor a pair of bronze shoes, and without those things she had a feeling of being, as it were, undressed. She felt as though the very horses and dogs were staring and laughing at the plainness of her dress, and clothes were all that she thought about. The question what she should eat and where she should sleep did not trouble her in the least. If only I could meet a gentleman friend, she thought to herself, I could get some money. There isn't one who would refuse me, I know. But no gentleman she knew came her way. It would be easy enough to meet them in the evening at the Renaissance, but they wouldn't let her in at the Renaissance in the shabby dress with no hat. What was she to do? After long hesitation, when she was sick of walking and sitting and thinking, Vanda made up her mind to fall back on her last resource, to go straight to the lodgings of some gentleman friend and ask for money. She pondered which to go to. Misha is out of the question. He's a married man. The old chap with the red hair will be at his office at this time. Vanda remembered a dentist called Finkel, a converted Jew who six months ago had given her a bracelet and on whose head she had once emptied a glass of beer at the supper at the German club. She was awfully pleased at the thought of Finkel. He'll be sure to give it me, if only I find him at home, she thought, as she walked in his direction. If he doesn't, I'll smash all the lamps in the house. Before she reached the dentist's door, she thought out her plan of action. She would run laughing up the stairs, dash into the dentist's room, and demand twenty-five roubles. But as she touched the bell, this plan seemed to vanish from her mind of itself. Vanda began suddenly feeling frightened and nervous, which was not at all her way. She was bold and saucy enough at drinking parties. But now, dressed in everyday clothes, feeling herself in the position of an ordinary person asking a favor who might be refused admittance, she felt suddenly timid and humiliated. She was ashamed and frightened. Perhaps he has forgotten me by now, she thought, hardly daring to pull the bell. And how can I go up to him in such a dress, looking like a beggar or some working girl? And she rang the bell irresolutely. She heard steps coming. It was the porter. Is the doctor at home? she asked. She would have been glad now if the porter had said no, but the latter, instead of answering, ushered her into the hall and helped her off with her coat. The staircase impressed her as luxurious and magnificent, but all its splendors what caught her eye most was an immense looking glass in which she saw a ragged figure without a fashionable jacket, without a big hat and without bronze shoes, and it seemed strange to Vanda that, now that she was humbly dressed and looked like a laundress or sewing girl, she felt ashamed, and no trace of her usual boldness and sauciness remained, and in her own mind she no longer thought of herself as Vanda, but as the Natasha Kavgin she used to be in the old days. Walk in, please said the maidservant, showing her into the consulting room. The doctor will be here in a minute. Sit down. 
Vanda sank into a soft arm chair. I'll ask him to lend it to me, she thought. That will be quite proper, for after all, I do know him. If only that servant would go, I don't like to ask before her. What does she want to stand there for? Five minutes later, the door opened and Finkel came in. He was a tall, dark Jew with fat cheeks and bulging eyes. His cheeks, his eyes, his chest, his body, all of him was so well fed, so loathsome and repellent. At the Renaissance and the German club, he had usually been rather tipsy and would spend his money freely on women and be very long-suffering and patient with their pranks. When Vanda, for instance, poured the beer over his head, he simply smiled and shook his finger at her. Now he had a cross, sleepy expression and looked solemn and frigid like a police captain, and he kept chewing something. "'What can I do for you?' he asked, without looking at Vanda. Vanda looked at the serious countenance of the maid and the smug figure of Finkel, who apparently did not recognize her, and she turned red. "'What can I do for you?' repeated the dentist, a little irritably. "'I've got a toothache,' murmured Vanda. "'Ah, which is the tooth? Where?' Vanda remembered she had a hole in one of her teeth. At the bottom, on the right, she said. Hmm, open your mouth. Finkel frowned and, holding his breath, began examining the tooth. Does it hurt? he asked, digging into it with a steel instrument. Yes, Vanda replied untruthfully. Shall I remind him? she was wondering. He would be sure to remember me, but that servant... Why will she stand there? Finkel suddenly snorted like a steam engine right into her mouth and said, I don't advise you to have it stopped. That tooth will never be worth keeping anyhow. After probing the tooth a little more and soiling Vanda's lips and gums with his tobacco-stained fingers, he held his breath again and put something cold into her mouth. Vanda suddenly felt a sharp pain cried out and clutched at Finkel's hand. It's all right, it's all right, he muttered. Don't you be frightened. That tooth would have been no use to you anyway. You must be brave. And his tobacco-stained fingers smeared with blood held up the tooth to her eyes, while the maid approached and put a basin to her mouth. You wash out your mouth with cold water when you get home, and that will stop the bleeding, said Finkel. He stood before her with the air of a man expecting her to go, waiting to be left in peace. Good day, she said, turning towards the door. Hm, and about my fee, inquired Finkel in a jesting tone. Oh, yes, Vanda remembered, blushing, and she handed the Jew the rouble that he had been given for her ring. When she got out into the street, she felt more overwhelmed with the shame than before, but now it was not her poverty she was ashamed of. She was unconscious now of not having a big hat and a fashionable jacket. She walked along the street, spitting blood and brooding on her life, her ugly, wretched life, and the insult she had endured and would have to endure tomorrow and next week, and all her life, up to the very day of her death. Oh, how awful it is! My God, how fearful! Next day, however, she was back at the Renaissance, and dancing there. She had on an enormous new red hat, a new fashionable jacket, and bronze shoes, and she was taken out to supper by a young merchant up from Kazan. End of chapter 16. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section 17 of The Chorus Girl and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tavarish. 
the chorus girl and other stories by anton chekhov translated by constance garnett a trivial incident it was a sunny august midday as in company with the russian prince who had come down in the world i drove into the immense so-called shabelsky pine forest where we were intending to look for woodcocks in virtue of the part he plays in this story my poor prince deserves a detailed description he was a tall dark man still youngish though already somewhat battered by life with long moustaches like a police captain's with prominent black eyes and with the manners of a retired army man he was a man of oriental type not very intelligent but straightforward and honest not a bully not a fop not a rake virtues which in the eyes of the general public are equivalent to a certificate of being a nonentity and a poor creature people generally did not like him he was never spoken of in the district except as the illustrious duffer i personally found the poor prince extremely nice with his misfortunes and failures which made up indeed his whole life first of all he was poor he did not play cards did not drink had no occupation did not poke his nose into anything and maintained a perpetual silence but yet he had somehow succeeded in getting through thirty to forty thousand roubles left him at his father's death god only knows what had become of the money all that i can say is that owing to lack of supervision a great deal was stolen by stewards bailiffs and even footmen a great deal went on lending money giving bail and standing security there were few landowners in the district who did not owe him money he gave to all who asked and not so much from good nature or confidence in people as from exaggerated gentlemanliness as though he would say take it and feel how comel for i am by the time i made his acquaintance he had got into debt himself had learned what it was like to have a second mortgage on his land and had sunk so deeply into difficulties that there was no chance of his ever getting out of them again there were days when he had no dinner and went about with an empty cigar holder but he was always seen clean and fashionably dressed and always smelt strongly of ilang ilang the prince's second misfortune was his absolute solitariness he was not married he had no friends nor relations his silent and reserved character and his comelfort deportment which became the more conspicuous the more anxious he was to conceal his poverty prevented him from becoming intimate with people for love affairs he was too heavy spiritless and cold and so rarely got on with women when we reached the forest this prince and i got out of the chaise and walked along a narrow woodland path which was hidden among huge ferns but before we had gone a hundred paces a tall lank figure with a long oval face wearing a shabby reefer jacket a straw hat and patent leather boots rose up from behind a young fir tree some three feet high as though he had sprung out of the ground the stranger held in one hand a basket of mushrooms with the other he playfully fingered a cheap watch chain on his waistcoat on seeing us he was taken aback smoothed his waistcoat coughed politely and gave an agreeable smile as though he were delighted to see such nice people as us then to our complete surprise he came up to us scraping with his long feet on the grass bending his whole person and still smiling agreeably lifted his hat and pronounced in a sugary voice with the intonations of a whining dog 
ay ay gentlemen painful as it is it is my duty to warn you that shooting is forbidden in this wood pardon me for venturing to disturb you though unacquainted but allow me to present myself i am grontovsky the head clerk on madame kandurin's estate pleased to make your acquaintance but why can't we shoot such is the wish of the owner of this forest the prince and i exchanged glances a moment passed in silence the prince stood looking pensively at a big fly agaric at his feet which he had crushed with his stick grontovsky went on smiling agreeably his whole face was twitching exuding honey and even the watch chain on his waistcoat seemed to be smiling and trying to impress us all with its refinement a shade of embarrassment passed over us like an angel passing all three of us felt awkward nonsense i said only last week i was shooting here very possible grontovsky sniggered through his teeth as a matter of fact everyone shoots here regardless of the prohibition but once i have met you it is my duty uh, my sacred duty to warn you i am a man in a dependent position if the forest were mine on the word of honour of a grontovsky i should not oppose your agreeable pleasure but whose fault is it that i am in a dependent position the lanky individual sighed and shrugged his shoulders i began arguing getting hot and protesting but the more loudly and impressively i spoke the more mawkish and sugary grontovsky's face became evidently the consciousness of a certain power over us afforded him the greatest gratification he was enjoying his condescending tone his politeness his manners and with peculiar relish pronounced his sonorous surname of which he was probably very fond standing before us he felt more than at ease but judging from the confused sideway glances he cast from time to time at his basket only one thing was spoiling his satisfaction the mushrooms womanish peasantish prose derogatory to his dignity we can't go back i said we have come over ten miles what's to be done sighed grontovsky if you had come not ten but a hundred thousand miles if the king even had come from america or from some other distant land even then i should think it my duty sacred so to say obligation uh, does the forest belong to nadezhda lvovna asked the prince yes nadezhda lvovna is she at home now yes i tell you what you go to her it is not more than half a mile from here if she gives you a note then i i needn't say <laughs> by all means i agreed it's much nearer than to go back you go to her sergey ivanch i said addressing the prince you know her the prince who had been gazing the whole time at the crushed agaric raised his eyes to me thought a minute and said i used to know her at one time but it's rather awkward for me to go to her besides i am in shabby clothes you go you don't know her it's more suitable for you to go i agreed we got into our chaise and followed by grontovsky's smiles drove along the edge of the forest to the manor house i was not acquainted with nadezhda lvovna kandurin ne shabelsky i had never seen her at close quarters and knew her only by hearsay i knew that she was incredibly wealthy richer than any one else in the province after the death of her father shabelsky who was a landowner with no other children 
she was left with several estates a stud farm and a lot of money i had heard that though she was only twenty-five or twenty-six she was ugly uninteresting and as insignificant as anybody and was only distinguished from the ordinary ladies of the district by her immense wealth it has always seemed to me that wealth is felt and that the rich must have special feelings unknown to the poor often as i passed by nadezhda lvovna's big fruit garden in which stood the large heavy house with its windows always curtained i thought what is she thinking at this moment is there happiness behind those blinds and so on once i saw her from a distance in a fine light cabriolet driving a handsome white horse and sinful man that i am i not only envied her but even thought that in her poses in her movements there was something special not to be found in people who are not rich just as persons of a servile nature succeeded in discovering good family at the first glance in people of the most ordinary exterior if they are a little more distinguished than themselves nadezhda lvovna's inner life was only known to me by scandal it was said in the district that five or six years ago before she was married during her father's lifetime she had been passionately in love with prince sergey ivanitch who was now beside me in the chaise the prince had been fond of visiting her father and used to spend whole days in his billiard room where he played pyramids indefatigably till his arms and legs ached six months before the old man's death he had suddenly given up visiting the shabelskys the gossip of the district having no positive facts to go upon explained this abrupt change in their relations in various ways some said that the prince having observed the plain daughter's feeling for him and being unable to reciprocate it considered it the duty of a gentleman to cut short his visits others maintained that old shabelsky had discovered why his daughter was pining away and had proposed to the poverty-stricken prince that he should marry her the prince imagining in his narrow-minded way that they were trying to buy him together with his title was indignant said foolish things and quarrelled with them what was true and what was false in this nonsense was difficult to say but that there was a portion of truth in it was evident from the fact that the prince always avoided conversation about nadezhda lvovna i knew that soon after her father's death nadezhda lvovna had married one kandurin a bachelor of law not wealthy but adroit who had come on a visit to the neighbourhood she married him not from love but because she was touched by the love of the legal gentleman who so it was said had cleverly played the lovesick swain at the time i am describing kandurin was for some reason living in cairo and writing thence to his friend the marshal of the district notes of travel while she sat languishingly behind lowering blinds surrounded by idle parasites and whiled away her dreary days in petty philanthropy on the way to the house the prince fell to talking it's three days since i have been at home he said in a half whisper with a sidelong glance at the driver i am not a child nor a silly woman and i have no prejudices but i can't stand the bailiffs when i see a bailiff in my house i turn pale and tremble and even have a twitching in the calves of my legs do you know rogozhin refused to honour my note the prince did not as a rule like to complain of his straitened circumstances where poverty was concerned he was reserved and exceedingly proud and sensitive and so this announcement surprised me he stared a long time at the yellow clearing 
warmed by the sun, watched a long string of cranes float in the azure sky, and turned facing me. And by the 6th of September I must have the money ready for the bank. The interest for my estate, he said aloud, by now regardless of the coachman. And where am I to get it? Altogether, old man, I am in a tight fix, an awfully tight fix. The prince examined the cock of his gun, blew on it for some reason, and began looking for the cranes, which by now were out of sight. Sergey Ivanch, I asked after a minute's silence, imagine if they sell your Shatilovka, what will you do? I? i don't know shatilovka can't be saved that's clear as daylight but i cannot imagine such a calamity i can't imagine myself without my daily bread secure what can i do i have had hardly any education i have not tried working yet for government service it is late to begin <sighs> besides where could i serve where could i be of use admitting that no great cleverness is needed for serving in our zemstvo for example yet i suffer from the devil knows what a sort of faint-heartedness i haven't a hapworth of pluck if i went into the service i should always feel i was not in my right place i am not an idealist i am not a utopian I haven't any special principles, but am simply, I suppose, stupid and thoroughly incompetent, a neurotic and a coward, altogether not like other people. All other people are like other people, only I seem to be something... a poor thing. I met Naryagin last Wednesday, you know him, drunk and slovenly doesn't pay his debts stupid the prince frowned and tossed his head a horrible person he said to me staggering i'm being balloted for as a justice of the peace of course they won't elect him but you see he believes he is fit to be a justice of the peace and considers that position within his capacity he has boldness and self-confidence I went to see our investigating magistrate, too. The man gets 250 rubles a month and does scarcely anything. All he can do is to stride backwards and forwards for days together in nothing but his underclothes. But ask him. He is convinced he is doing his work and honorably performing his duty. I couldn't go on like that i should be ashamed to look the clerk in the face at that moment grantovsky on a chestnut horse galloped by us with a flourish on his left arm the basket bobbed up and down with the mushrooms dancing in it as he passed us he grinned and waved his hand as though we were old friends blockhead the prince filtered through his teeth looking after him it's wonderful how disgusting it sometimes is to see satisfied faces a stupid animal feeling due to hunger i expect what was i saying oh yes about going into the service i should be ashamed to take the salary and yet to tell the truth it is stupid if one looks at it from a broader point of view, more seriously, I am eating what isn't mine now, am I not? But why am I not ashamed of that? It is a case of habit, I suppose, and not being able to realize one's true position. But that position is most likely awful. I looked at him, wondering if the prince were showing off but his face was mild and his eyes were mournfully following the movements of the chestnut horse racing away as though his happiness were racing away with it apparently he was in that mood of irritation and sadness when women weep quietly for no reason 
and men feel a craving to complain of themselves of life of god when i got out of the chaise at the gates of the house the prince said to me a man once said wanting to annoy me that i have the face of a card sharper i have noticed that card sharpers are usually dark do you know it seems that if i really had been born a card sharper i should have remained a decent person to the day of my death for i should never have had the boldness to do wrong i tell you frankly i have had the chance once in my life of getting rich if i had told a lie a lie to myself and one woman and one other person whom i know would have forgiven me for lying i should have put into my pocket a million but i could not i hadn't the pluck from the gates we had to go to the house through the copse by a long road level as a ruler and planted on each side with thick lopped lilacs the house looked somewhat heavy tasteless like a facade on the stage it rose clumsily out of a mass of greenery and caught the eye like a great stone thrown on the velvety turf at the chief entrance I was met by a fat old footman in a green swallow-tail coat and big silver-rimmed spectacles, without making any announcement, only looking contemptuously at my dusty figure, he showed me in. As I mounted the soft-carpeted stairs, there was for some reason a strong smell of India rubber. At the top I was enveloped in an atmosphere found only in museums in seigneurial mansions and old-fashioned merchant houses it seemed like the smell of something long past which had once lived and died and had left its soul in the rooms i passed through three or four rooms on my way from the entry to the drawing-room i remember bright yellow shining floors lustres wrapped in stiff muslin narrow striped rugs which stretched not straight from door to door as they usually do but along the walls so that not venturing to touch the bright floor with my muddy boots i had to describe a rectangle in each room in the drawing-room where the footman left me stood old-fashioned ancestral furniture in white covers shrouded in twilight it looked surly and elderly and as though out of respect for its repose not a sound was audible even the clock was silent it seemed as though the princess tarakanov had fallen asleep in the golden frame and the water and the rats were still and motionless through magic the daylight afraid of disturbing the universal tranquillity scarcely pierced through the lowered blinds and lay on the soft rugs in pale slumbering streaks three minutes passed and a big elderly woman in black with her cheek bandaged up walked noiselessly into the drawing-room she bowed to me and pulled up the blinds at once enveloped in the bright sunlight the rats and water in the picture came to life and movement princess tarakanov was awakened and the old chairs frowned gloomily her honour will be here in a minute sir sighed the old lady frowning too a few more minutes of waiting and i saw nadezhda lvovna what struck me first of all was that she certainly was ugly short scraggy and round-shouldered her thick chestnut hair was magnificent her face pure and with a look of culture in it was aglow with youth there was a clear and intelligent expression in her eyes but the whole charm of her head was lost 
through the thickness of her lips and the oval acute facial angle i mentioned my name and announced the object of my visit i really don't know what i am to say she said in hesitation dropping her eyes and smiling i don't like to refuse and at the same time do please i begged nadezhda lvovna looked at me and laughed i laughed too she was probably amused by what grontovsky had so enjoyed that is the right of giving or withholding permission my visit suddenly struck me as queer and strange i don't like to break the long-established rules said madame kandurin shooting has been forbidden on our estate for the last six years no she shook her head resolutely excuse me i must refuse you if i allow you i must allow others i don't like unfairness either let all or no one i am sorry i sighed it's all the sadder because we have come more than ten miles i'm not alone i added prince sergey ivanitch is with me i uttered the prince's name with no arriere pensee not prompted by any special motive or aim i simply blurted it out without thinking in the simplicity of my heart hearing the familiar name madame kandurin started and bent a prolonged gaze upon me i noticed her nose turn pale that makes no difference she said dropping her eyes as i talked to her i stood at the window that looked out on the shrubbery i could see the whole shrubbery with the avenues and the ponds and the road by which i had come at the end of the road beyond the gates the black of our chaise made a dark patch near the gate with his back to the house the prince was standing with his legs apart talking to the lanky grontovsky madame kandurin had been standing all the time at the other window she looked from time to time towards the shrubbery and from the moment i mentioned the prince's name she did not turn away from the window excuse me she said screwing up her eyes as she looked towards the road and the gate but it would be unfair to allow you only to shoot and besides what pleasure is there in shooting birds what's it for are they in your way a solitary life immured within four walls with its indoor twilight and heavy smell of decaying furniture disposes people to sentimentality madame kandurin's idea did her credit but i could not resist saying if one takes that line one ought to go barefoot boots are made out of the leather of slaughtered animals one must distinguish between a necessity and a caprice madame kandurin answered in a toneless voice she had by now recognized the prince and did not take her eyes off his figure it is hard to describe the delight and the suffering with which her ugly face was radiant her eyes were smiling and shining her lips were quivering and laughing while her face craned closer to the panes keeping hold of a flower pot with both hands with bated breath and with one foot slightly lifted she reminded me of a dog pointing and waiting with passionate impatience for fetch it i looked at her and at the prince who could not tell a lie once in his life and i felt angry and bitter against truth and falsehood which plays such an elemental part in the personal happiness of men the prince started suddenly took aim and fired a hawk flying over him fluttered its wings and flew like an arrow far away he aimed too high i said and so nadezhda lvovna i sighed moving away from the window you will not permit madame kandurin was silent i have the honour to take my leave i said and i beg you to forgive my disturbing you 
madame kandurin would have turned facing me and had already moved through a quarter of the angle when she suddenly hid her face behind the hangings as though she felt tears in her eyes that she wanted to conceal good-bye forgive me she said softly i bowed to her back and strode away across the bright yellow floors no longer keeping to the carpet i was glad to get away from this little domain of gilded boredom and sadness and i hastened as though anxious to shake off a heavy fantastic dream with its twilight its enchanted princess its lustres at the front door a maid-servant overtook me and thrust a note into my hand shooting is permitted on showing this n k i read End of section 17 End of The Chorus Girl and Other Stories by Anton Chekhov Translated by Constance Garnett